Thanks for joining us at New Life for this week's message. Our hope is that God's Word will prompt you to go and make followers of Jesus in your community. We encourage you to connect with us after the message on our website or on Facebook. You can also give online or in person at any of our services to help the vision of New Life to make disciples. Thanks again for choosing New Life, and we hope to see you soon. We've been in the middle of a sermon series called Power, and what we're doing is we're walking through the book of Acts, and we're looking at different stories in the book of Acts where we see the Holy Spirit empowering God's people to do transformational things. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn them to Acts chapter 9? We're going to continue on with this storyline of power. And today we're talking about the Holy Spirit power to change. One of the coolest parts about being at this church now for the entirety of its existence, which I think we're going on like 15 years now, is we have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives, if not thousands at this point, changed by the gospel of Jesus. And every so often in a culture of change, you will see certain game changers rise above and take on leadership roles that maybe when you first met them, you never even saw coming. I can say probably pretty honestly that everyone that knew me here as someone who was attending New Life probably didn't foresee that I would be the lead pastor of the church. I don't think anyone saw that coming. And so the Holy Spirit does those things where he changes people's hearts, he saves them, but then he also puts them into roles that you never thought that they would be in so that everyone around could say, that must be Jesus. And every so often in Scripture, follow me with these thoughts, these are important. Every so often in Scripture, you will meet a game changer. In life, we know what game changers look like, right? So Michael Jordan, anyone like basketball? Michael Jordan is a game changer. Basketball was never the same once he stepped on the court. Babe Ruth was a game changer for baseball. Baseball was never the same when he stepped on the field. Martin Luther King was a game changer for civil rights. Things were never the same once Martin Luther King started preaching, I have a dream. The same thing is true in the Bible. People like Abraham, Moses, David, of course the climactic game changer of all of history is, if you don't get that right, you're in trouble, okay? That's Jesus. And then after Jesus, we're going to be introduced in Acts chapter 9 to a character in the Bible today who is an absolute game changer of the New Testament, and his name is Paul. And I want to give you a definition of a game changer as we get started. Someone that's a game changer, write it down. You know they're a game changer when things looked completely different before they showed up. And so Paul was the greatest missionary the church has ever seen. And if we didn't have Paul used by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, our church life would be radically different because, probably foremost, because he reached Gentiles and most of us in this Midwestern culture are not Jewish. And so because he's a game changer, I want to give you a little background into who he was. Anyone in here grow up rich? You're like, I'm not raising my hand to that. No one likes that. You're like the guy, if you, you are the woman who made their money, you know, by raising themselves up. And well, that's something to brag about. I don't want to say I grew up rich. Paul grew up with a silver spoon. Paul was privileged. He was a Jewish child raised in a devout Jewish home. Paul would have grown up wearing name brand clothes. He would have had access to the latest iPhone. Some of you are already doing this with your kids. They're like five years old, and they've got an iPhone 15. Bad parenting, just so you know, but that's a side note. He had the latest iPhone as a kid. He didn't just go to a lake house. He had pickerel. I mean, he was privileged. He was a Jewish guy who was so privileged that he had Roman citizenship, which would have been really rare, and God redeems these qualities in him so that he can go out with his dual citizenship and travel throughout the Roman Empire and have opportunities that lower status Jewish people wouldn't have to make Christ known. God redeems his wealth. Paul wasn't just wealthy, he was very determined. We would see in the Bible as you map out his journey that he's probably walking somewhere around 20 miles per day making Christ known. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but growing up wealthy and being a hard worker don't always go hand in hand, but Paul had both qualities. And so he would walk on rugged terrain, It would be very hot. 
They did not have modern technology, and he was just tough. He was so tough that he says this in, the God, in his accounts to the churches. He says, I bear the marks of Jesus on my body. And he wasn't talking figuratively. He was talking literally. He would be beaten and flogged within an inch of his life. He'd be left for dead in open sea. He would be stoned, and then he would get up, and he'd go preach the gospel again. This guy was an absolute rock star for the faith. He was a brilliant mind. Write that down about Paul. He wrote the most brilliant book in all of the Bible, the book of Romans. It's where we get most of our rich Christian theology. And so he wouldn't have walked around with scrolls. He would have had the Bible in the Old Testament memorized in his mind. He quotes over 100 verses of Old Testament scripture just in this one theological book. And he's writing it like he's just writing a pen pal to his friend. Is anyone in church bilingual? You should be proud of that if you are. That's a pretty big account. I'm not, not pig Latin, actually bilingual. Right, who are you? Raise your hand high. Be proud of that. Right? I don't know if it's a rough second dialect, but how about trilingual? Is there anyone trilingual in the crowd? We're going to fact check this. I see a little kid that's trilingual. That's incredible. Right? You need to hang out with my kids. They're not as smart as you. So how about this? Paul would have spoken probably four languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and then possibly Latin. This guy was brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. He went to school and was trained in Tarsus. It would have been the Harvard of its day. Martin Luther says this, Paul was the wisest man after Christ. This is the caliber of person that God redeems to be a game changer. He writes 13 of 27 books of the New Testament. In fact, once we get to chapter 9, the story kind of shifts to Paul. And if you take Paul out of the New Testament, you have a very small portion of Scripture. He is an absolute brilliant mind. But check this out. Maybe you've known this to be true in your life, not because you're brilliant, just because you've seen this. Paul, by all accounts, was single. And I would just kind of say this. If he's single, he's probably lonely. And so because of our demographics starting in the fall, a lot of new lifers are going to be single and ready to mingle. I've already told our college students, don't go to a fancy Bible college. Don't spend 30 grand a year racking up debt to find a Christian wife or Christian husband. For $5,000, this is, you can mark my words, put this in Rock Creek so you know it too. For $5,000, I will personally be a matchmaker for you, okay? <laughs> there are more Christians in our college ministries than probably any Bible college, I mean, maybe that's, that's extreme. That's my $5,000 pitch. But Paul was single by all accounts, and so his hardship was endured alone. So one of my favorite things to do with my wife is I like to go home and vent to her and complain, and oh, ministry's hard, and this and that, and she kind of has a tissue ready for me at the door. <laughs> Paul does all of that alone, and he has this intense dependency on Christ that we probably could not even imagine. Paul was just such an interesting character in the Bible. He was an absolute game changer. And he's not just brilliant. He's not just wealthy. He has all of these giftings that the world would deem worthy. He's also just completely and utterly lost. Have you ever met someone like that? They've got everything at their fingertips, and they don't have Jesus, and it's just a shame. And you say to yourself, man, if they would just get saved, that's Paul's story. He's Saul and then turns to Paul. If he would just get saved, look what could possibly potentially happen. That's Paul. He gets saved and radical things happen. And as the story picks up in chapter 9, we see him running around, killing Christians. He's headed off to a town to ask permission to kill more Christians. Right? He's throwing men down. He's stoning them to, get, to death. He's having people throw off their coats like they're warming up for pitchers in a bullpen. And he's just all about destroying the local church. And there's this shift that takes place in the Bible where he goes from persecuted, persecutor to persecuted. He goes from murderer to someone who's having his life chased over and over and over again. And so here's my point about this guy that kills Christians. Who is it in your life, maybe it's yourself, look at me, who is it that you have deemed as hopeless? Who is it that you've written off and said, man, I am so glad that I'm not like that person. There's no way that God can use them. God says, I can use anyone. I'm going to use a murderer named Saul. 
The whole point of this story is that there is power in Jesus Christ. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the transformational work of the Holy Spirit. And that power is to change. Jesus changes people. Amen? Are you awake? Jesus actually changes people. We're not just showing up here to go through a religious ceremony and say our, you know, three songs and hear a message from Scripture and then go home and have a nice barbecue for lunch. You can do all of those things, but when you walk into this place, know that you're on holy ground, not because the old Gibson's been transformed into a church, but because the Holy Spirit is working in and through us, and he has the power to change here. He has the power to change in Rock Creek. He has the power to change downtown. He has the power to change in Peru. He is in the business of changing people's hearts. Acts chapter 9, he changes Saul. Let's look at it together. But Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. And he asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he basically goes and he asks permission to his boss if he can go kill more people. And the reason they were called the way and not Christians is because the word Christians didn't exist yet. And so the way they identified themselves was they said, I want to follow Jesus. He made a very clear and definitive statement that got him crucified. He said, I am the way to heaven. And so we follow him. So we follow the way. And in modern thought, no one has a problem with Jesus being a way, a religious belief, a nice guy, a philosophy, an ideology that can lead you on a path to God. But many, many people in our culture have a problem with saying Jesus is the way. But what you need to understand if you submit to Christ is our whole context of our faith is founded on that statement. Jesus is not a way, but Jesus is the way. And you're like, well, I don't know if I believe all that, but I'm very religious. Look at me. So was Saul. Could you write the book of Romans right before he came to Christ? He still knew all those Old Testament scriptures. I'm very religious. So was Saul. I'm not just religious. I'm very a spiritual being. I'm very spiritual. So was Saul. I'm very passionate about being spiritual. I promise you this. You were not as passionate as Saul. The fundamental dividing issue in our culture is the same as it was 2,000 years ago. You start saying Jesus is the way instead of a way, you better watch out. You're going to face some things in your life that you might not want to experience. How do you feel about that reality? Jesus says, I am the way. Look at what the Bible says. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so at this point, the plot thickens, and Saul, who thinks he has everything figured out, realizes that he does not have anything figured out. He was putting all of his investments, he was taking all of his poker chips, he was pushing them to the middle of the table, and he was saying, Jesus is not the Son of God. He is not the third member of the Trinity. He died on a cross, but he didn't rise from the dead. He does not exist anymore. And now in this moment, pivotal in history, he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I imagine his heart drops. And he said, who are you, Lord? And there's where it all changes, right? He says, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. And here's why that's interesting to me. Jesus loves his church. If you've been washed in the blood of Jesus, you're a part of his church. It's not a building, it's a people. Jesus has already resurrected and gone on to be back with the Father. He says, why are you persecuting me? Because Saul is persecuting the church. And so here's the translation that's so important that we need to grab a hold of. When people come after you, you don't have to fight all your own battles. You serve a Savior who is taking you at the front lines and saying, if you're going to mess with them, you're going to mess with me. He says, right to Saul, why are you persecuting me? But rise and enter into the city and you will be told what to do. And the men were traveling with him, stood speechless, and hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So these people around him, God's working. They don't know what's going on. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. And so they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, 
and he didn't eat anything, and he didn't drink anything. And we're going to stop there. I want you to write this down. Blindness is not just physical. See, his whole life he'd been blind even though he could see clearly. Now God's flipping that on its head and he's showing him spiritually what he's looked like for the last however many years as he's gone around beating up Christians and not acknowledging that Christ is the Messiah. He's saying, you thought you had sight before, but you were spiritually dead. Now you're going to be spiritually alive and I'm going to give you a point in time where you can actually experience physical blindness so that you can see the depravity of your situation. Everything flips on its head now that Saul truly meets Jesus. He can't eat or drink anything for three days. Christ says, Saul, why do you persecute me? I can't even imagine what this guy's going through in this moment. He's sitting down realizing everything that he's been about for the, ever, for the last however many years is completely and utterly wrong. What does change look like? Write this down. We're going to go through a couple of points and then we're going to be out of here. What does it look like to have an genuine encounter with Christ? Number one, this thought I had this week, and I actually put some stuff on my iPad that I didn't have kind of run through my head this morning because I felt like God wanted me to speak to a certain demographic through the nudging and prompting of the Holy Spirit that I hadn't planned on talking to. But the first thing I want to tell you is this. When it comes to change, Jesus Christ is your, Jesus Christ is mine, Jesus Christ is a lost world around us, change agent. There's no higher power. There's no other way. There's no amount of happy thoughts that we can think to some God of the sky and the universe. There's no millions and billions of gods. There's one God with one Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune three God in one, And his son's name is Jesus Christ. And there are a lot of things, write this down, in this world that can help you. But look at me. Look at me, Rock Creek, when I say this. Only Jesus Christ can change you. Jesus Christ is the change agent. And if that's not true, that's what I'm hanging my hat on. That's what I'm giving my life to. If that's not true, we need to pack up right now. No more tithing, no more volunteering. You can get all of your social meets net, met with better donuts and better coffee and better lunches. You can go to the YMCA, just take out the C. You can go to sporting events, you can go to your workplace, you can go to the local bar. If Jesus Christ isn't the change agent, quit coming here week after week, quit getting in life groups and serving and giving your life to and giving your finance to this movement known as the local church because it's all a big hoax and I am 100% just a total joke. But if Jesus Christ is real, if Jesus Christ has the power to transform and change, if Jesus Christ is the change agent, then that's something that we gotta take very, very seriously. Do you know this Jesus who has allowed this church to not just be on the north side of town but go downtown and reach the hurting? To be in Rock Creek this morning where they're hearing the gospel proclaimed with people from Aberdeen and people from Rock Creek that's bringing people from death to life. Do you know this Jesus? He's transforming hearts. He's setting the captive free. He's taking the addict and he's giving them victory. He's giving her victory over their addiction. Do you know This Jesus who's a change agent. My idea, what I wrote on my iPad is this. Let me find it. Oh, it's very simple. I already said it. I got excited. I just want to speak to a certain demographic. If you walk in these doors, listen online, sitting in Rock Creek this morning, and you are an addict. If your life is a hot mess and you have been relying on willpower and white knuckling it to give up this thing, maybe in Rock Creek this morning it's meth. Maybe in Aberdeen right now it's, it's alcohol. 
And I will tell you statistically, about 60 to 70% of our men in any local evangelical church, it's pornography. So let's not just kid ourselves and say this is just for about 50 people to come to celebrate recovery on a Friday night. This is a mass issue, you know, alarms going off issue, addiction in our culture. If you are an addict that's walking in the church or listening online, you need to hear this. There's no higher power that's going to do it for you. You have to submit your life not to a higher power, but to a sovereign Savior. And remember I've told you before I left on my little trip to Denver, I told you something very clearly, that sometimes the Holy Spirit prompts us to say things and to do things. To me, that is a Holy Spirit prompting. You need to hear that this morning. It's not about a higher power. It's about a Savior of the universe, and his name is Jesus. Other things can help you. Only Jesus can save you. And so let me give you some encouragement if you're an addict. You're like, I'm not an addict. Well, you might be, okay? That's called denial. They can work with you and CR on that. Let me just, let me just tell you this, because this is what I feel like the Holy Spirit wanted me to say. It's time that you leave your shame cycle. And if you're an addict, you know what that's about. You feel bad, but then by the next day, you're just doing it again. And you feel worse, and by the next day, you're even doing something more. Jesus wants you to break you out of that shame cycle and be your change agent, but you have to repent of your sin and quit trying to do it all yourself and trying harder and hoarding more and release control to him and say, I'm going to worship you in spirit and in truth. I'm going to put accountability in my life. I'm going to trust that you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't have to be perfect because I serve a perfect Savior. I don't have to keep putting myself back on that cross because you already died in my place on it. There's hope in the gospel. Paul is a murderer. If Paul can be, he says he's the chief of sinners. If Paul can be forgiven and redeemed, then there is hope for you in your addiction. There's no amount of willpower. There's no amount of reasoning outside of the Holy Spirit grabbing your heart that's going to work. Here's how I know this is true. Paul has Stephen, who is just a great guy, laid before his feet. They throw their coats down. Paul's so angry, he says, throw the stones. They murder this guy as he lays out the gospel, and he starts asking God to forgive them. Paul watches this happen. All that happens afterwards is he gets angrier. He wants to go to Damascus to get permission to kill more people and to bound them up. If reasoning and motivation by human standards could do it and not the power of Jesus, his heart would have been changed as he watched Stephen get his head beat in with a rock. It's not until Jesus shows up and grabs his heart that change is even possible. Have you experienced the redemptive power of Jesus in your life? Paul has a legal status that lets the gospel be made known. His original intent was to use it to kill Christian. God redeems it and changes it in his life. He speaks two, three, four languages. God takes his knowledge of language and redeems it to make Christ known all throughout the world 2,000 years ago. He's a brilliant mind. God redeems it. God wants to do the same thing in your life. Purchased with the blood of Christ. Number two, write this down. This is just case study time. This is what I've seen in the church. I've got 15 years in this church since I was a little kid spiritually. And I've got 10 years now full time. I have watched hundreds, if not over a thousand People make commitments to Christ, get baptized, start coming. They, weren't, they don't have a church background. I meet these people Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And I want you to see this, and I put that on the screen there for you to write down. When this happens to you, Jesus grabs your heart, he changes you. That internal change that happens, and it can happen this morning, has very much external consequence. And so this is just kind of the let's keep it real point in the message. Not every change in your life is going to be pretty. Paul goes from hunter to hunted. And so my experience is this, watching people and then watching my own life play out. My most common conversion reality when I see people give their life to Christ is that their life gets harder. Paul had a circle around him when he was killing people. 
He was getting pats on the back from the spiritual high ups, the religious leaders of the day who were pharisaical and hated Jesus. Paul was known for his hard work ethic. After Christ, he was absolutely hated and stoned for loving Jesus. There had to be a season in this man's life as he starts building the local church that he was incredibly lonely. And I want you to hear this. As a therapist, I will tell you the most powerful human emotion that I have seen transpire in people's lives that causes them to make train wreck decisions is the emotion of feeling lonely. Lonely can take you to dark places that you never thought you would go and be a catalyst for decisions that you never thought that you would make. And Paul loses his entire circle as he says yes to Jesus on that road. There had to be times where he was incredibly lonely. He does the right thing, and it's not always easy, and it's not always fun. There are going to be times where your life gets much harder because you said yes to Jesus. And I think to not tell you that would just be disingenuous. I was thinking this week, I was sitting in a church much smaller than ours where everyone's on fire and, you know, just kind of like downtown, they're just trying to make it happen, right? Sink or swim. And, and a couple of things, I want to just make sure I say this. I want to just pay special attention and not lose focus of what God is doing right here in this North Campus because God has used this campus to reach thousands of people with the gospel. And I want you to hear me say this. After coming back from some church playing stuff, we are just getting started on this campus. Do you believe that? Or do you believe that it's awesome what's going on in Rock Creek. It's awesome what's going on downtown. It's awesome what's going on in Peru. But we have a mission and vision of disciple making right here. And it's about to get crazy this fall. Are you ready to see Jesus explode in this place? When you watch those things happen and experience that in your life, your life will inevitably get harder. And so here's what I'm thinking this week. I start reflecting. And I'm thinking, whatever happened to this person? Whatever happened to that person? I remember baptizing them. I remember doing their wedding. I remember when we dedicated their children to the Lord. And I'm just thinking back over the last 10 years of just rich ministry where we've seen God move in a mighty way. And there's just these people stuck in my crawl. I don't know what happened to them. I hope they found another church where they love Jesus. But history tells me this. There's a really good chance that they landed nowhere, and they're just kind of waffling back and forth now in their faith. And I promise this gets more encouraging. <laughs> but my, my thought was just very simple. I can usually identify a time where they got radically you know, on fire for Jesus, and they went through all these things, and then something happened in their life that then caused them to kind of drift to the sidelines. Maybe it was some drama in church. Maybe they realized for the first time that Jesus is perfect, but people are sinners. Or maybe it was a struggle in their marriage. Or maybe it was a job that didn't work out, or kids that rebelled. And you'd love to tell this sappy story where everyone that that happens to actually figures it out and lives happily ever after. But my experience is this. There is an attrition to this thing called ministry, and people fall by the wayside, and that's not okay. And when you submit your life to Christ, the enemy is going to come attacking you. There's going to be things that happen, and if you're not rooted in the gospel, you're going to easily drift away, and you need to hear that life gets harder when Satan actually sees you as a threat. Last thing I want to tell you, we're going to go with this. Jesus breaks your pride to change your heart. Write that down, please. I can see if you don't write it down, so it's kind of awkward. Just act like you're writing it down. Chuck, could you make sure in Rock Creek they wrote that down? Thank you very much. Jesus breaks your pride to change your heart. One of the clearest evidences of the Holy Spirit working in your life is humility. Jesus absolutely breaks Saul down to a lowest common denominator point in his life so that he can set the reset button to use him in a mighty way. I had this idea in my head this week. You guys know what those are? Those are lethal weapons. I own those in sixth grade. Who in here has, like, uh, passing DMV flying colors eyesight? Who can tell me what those gloves say? 
not Franklin, that's easy. What does it say? Sugar Ray Leonard. Okay, those were mine in sixth grade. I was 12 years old. I bought them at the best place to buy boxing gloves on the planet, Toys R Us, which, you know, rests in peace. It was my birthday. I was 12. My mom went with me, said I could pick out something from Toys R Us. I picked out the Sugar Rays because I was a warrior at heart. I promise you this has a point. And so what we'd do is I was left-handed. Most of my friends were right-handed. We'd put on one glove and we'd go at it. And then my brother-in-law, who was just this, you know, pimple-faced kid who was 15, my sister didn't take New Life's advice and she started dating way too young. And then, you know, God punished her by the marriage of my brother-in-law. But now he's one of my best friends. He's a great guy. Uh, he was 15 and I was 12. He wasn't like a brother-in-law to me because they started dating and I was so young. He was just a brother to me. And he was kind of like Wayne, you know, Wayne and Kevin from Wonder Years. He was, he was Wayne. And he said, Rodney, why don't you put on those sugar rays? I'll go right, you go left, we'll go to the garage. And so I thought, okay, that sounds fun. Before I knew it, I was on the ground and my head was just ringing. I felt like my head was going to explode. Have you ever had your bell rung where you didn't even see it coming? Maybe it's in your past life and now you know Jesus. You don't have to admit it here in church. My head, I didn't even know what had happened. I was completely disoriented. And he told me later that I lost the fight. And so I, I had these sugar rays for many years, and then I donated them to uh, Research Greatness, and I gave them to somebody else. I don't know what I did with them. But I got rid of those gloves, and I grew up. But my bell was rung, and for some reason, I was thinking of that story this week. And I was thinking, man, that's exactly what happened to Paul. He was sitting in a garage in Bakersfield, California, on Silverado Street, and he doesn't even see it coming, and he gets his bell rung by Jesus walking down the road fully confident with his sugar rays on that he's got everything figured out and Jesus has another plan and he says, let me just show you who I am and he knocks him on the ground and he blinds him and he changes the entirety of his life and what I want to tell you is this, Jesus has to humble your heart before he can use you in a mighty way. Paul's on this road to destruction. What is the road taking you? Where is the road that you're on taking you? Are you on this narrow road that leads to life? Matthew chapter 7, 13, only a few are on it. Are you on a broad road that's leading to destruction where you think everything's okay and Jesus is opening up your heart this morning and you're hearing maybe for the first time in your life, it's not okay. Jesus will ring your bell to grab your heart. Do you know him? Do you serve him? Are you playing religious games with him or have you surrendered your heart to him? He's your change agent. I don't care what addiction you're in, he's your change agent. I don't care how bad your marriage is, he's your change agent. And I don't care how hopeless your situation feels, there is hope in the gospel, amen? There is hope in the gospel. Do you know Jesus? Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. As the praise team comes back up, Lord, I pray that you would grab hearts in this place and at Rock Creek, that you would transform us from the inside out. I pray a blessing over the North Campus. God, this week as we start Vacation Bible School and proclaim change to these young people, I pray that more people would volunteer and just show up and watch what's going on. Renewing us a passion to reach lost people and see change happen. We pray these things in your precious and holy name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Thanks again for checking out this week's message. If you have any questions or would like to know more about how you can get involved in New Life, we hope that you'll reach out to us on the website or on Facebook. Check back next week as we continue to seek God's heart for our community.